a very interesting session and uh, the person who is uh, going to manage this session is a uh, veteran volunteer, Manju. So can we have Manju on this test? Uh, by the way, we had awards for the most interesting question for last session. So Pinkes, can we have you on this test for giving this award? Yeah. For most interesting question, we had award for uh, last session. So can you hand it over to the person who asked? Prashant, I believe. Prashant. Get fired. So, so let's, uh, they, I think we are going to shift gears here completely from what is product management. I have been told to do a tricycle, as one of the doctors said. So we are jumping directly into marketing and sales, more on that target and say, what is that we need to do to tell the, those product management, what is that we need to do? How is that we can differentiate in the market? What is that attribute we need to pick? So generally what happens in many startups here in India, especially in India, is we pick up a technology, we love features, we go overboard to do this feature, that feature, but what really one customer wants, what is that you need to do in the position, in his mind, which makes a difference, we keep forgetting all the time. That's why you see a lot of startups dying within a year kind of a stuff. We have two experts from Silicon Valley today flying all the way, just to explain to you what does it take to differentiate your product. What is it you do so that you can survive? You can win the art of survival so that you don't die. Uh, I, I've been told clearly that give a Twitter introduction, not crossing 140 text words. So I'll be very short in the introduction about the speakers. Raj is going to go first. And Bob is going to go next. Bob is actually a 20 years industry veteran who gives a guest lecture, who keeps talking about differentiation, position strategy all the time. He's the managing director of Firebreak, and he has helps technology companies, including startups, what is that you need to do in positioning so that you can increase your market share, increase your revenue. And the other person is Bob uh, Raj. He's also flight from Silicon Valley. He's a serial entrepreneur, started many companies. He's a great storyteller. He tells you how to differentiate, how to pick up an attribute. In fact, he has, he's a published author. He has 12 books to his name also. He's a big time blogger. I think in his speech, he'll tell you what's a blog handle. He follows everything. So without further ado, I want the speakers to on the stage, please. Raj. We are still trying to differentiate there. So while, while they get ready and they're on the stage, I just uh, basically want to talk, tell you some of the things, how it goes. Just a word, word of caution here. Touch, come on. Come on. Just one. So it's uh, supposed to be, it's printed as 60 minutes. It's actually 90 minutes, which means we are actually eating into your uh, tea session. I hope you don't mind. And I hope that these speakers will take you in such a journey that you'll forget that it is 90 minutes. So let's just welcome Raj. Raj, you can take over. Thank you so much. Can you all hear me in the back? Yes? OK. Uh, good evening, everyone. So today I'll start with um, uh, talking about being different. The key word is I will be focusing on being. Because uh, talking about uh, being different is different, but actually being different is a little bit harder. So I started this journey about distinguishing yourself in 2005 and I published a manifesto called 25 Ways to Distinguish Yourself. And I was thinking that it will be a good fun thing to do, but when I saw that there were 75,000 people who downloaded it very quickly, I thought not only me, there are many people who are very interested in distinguishing themselves. Honestly, I'll first share a story about uh, Zach Crane. So this uh, was in a TV show called Shark Tank, for those of you who are familiar with it. So where uh, entrepreneurs pitch their startup, and right then and there, there will be uh, seasoned investors like Mark Cuban, who will invest right there, if they like the story. Zach Crane was which was basically sleeves for uh, uh, water bottles, Coke bottles, and a school little thing. He was making a lot of money. But throughout the presentation, he would say, beep, 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 beep. And every now and then, so oh, let me show it, beep, beep. And then finally, when it came to whether to invest or not, Mark Cuban said, I know, you know, Zach, I was really wanting to invest in this. Then I thought, for the rest of my life, whenever I call you, you'll say, beep, beep. And then I'll go nuts. So let me pass on, pass the investment, right? So basically, the reason I told this story is because 
being different for the sake of being different won't help much because it has to be meaningful difference. It has to move the needle for the people for your target audience. Really, why should we be different? It's basically because being part of the commodity crowd erodes your value. Like if you, if you are one of the many things that is already existing and you walk in and then you say, I'm here. People will say, who are you? Because there are already so many things that are already there. You disappear from the market, still don't know that you didn't exist. You can say, you know, tech crunch effect. I come in and make, come with a bang. And people will at least give some attention, then they forget you. But distinguishing yourself may give you a premium because if you look different, at least people are curious, you know, why, is the, why are you in this market space? What are you trying to do? At least they will give you a chance. And whether later you will, they will pay you money, that's a different story. You have to see the value. But at least they will give you a chance. I took a very mature industry to show how you can look at the world differently. I took the industry of um, uh, cars. There are hundreds of brands and there are hundreds of stories. If you say, you know, Volkswagen, people will think of Beetle. Subaru, people will think of an all-wheel drive. If you, I can, we, there is a story everywhere. And then if you want to introduce a new vehicle, you first have to think, what is the new story that I, I can bring to the mature industry? Or you can say, you know, I'm going to not even sell the cars, I'll rent the cars. But even there, there are many people who are renting cars. So Hertz will say, I'm the market leader, listen to me. Avis will say, I'm, I'm not the market leader, but we try harder. So that is the differentiating story, right? And then, so, and then, if there's an entrenched industry, enterprise rent-a-car will come in, they will say, we will pick you up. So why should you rent cars only at the airports? Wherever you are, we will come to your home, we'll pick you up and we'll rent a car. That's how they look at the market differently. And then you say, now buying car is over, renting car is over, they will pick you up. What else can we do? And that is when Zipcar comes in and says, why should you rent a car, uh, what if you want to rent a car wherever you want, whenever you want. So that's where the zip car comes in. Again, they looked at a mature industry and said there is another way to look at the market. And now it seems like buying, renting, rent wherever you want or you want to pick it up, it's over, what else can we do? Then somebody will say, get around comes in and says, why should you rent a car from a company? Like I'm from Silicon Valley, I come here, I'll be here for three weeks. My car is uh, sitting there idle. I could rent my car using the get around service. Because it's an idle car, I can make some money. So like that, like me, there may be thousands of people who are leaving their cars idle. So that's another market. So now what else can we do? So let's think about a new way. And then comes Uber. And there they say, you know, not only the car may be free, the driver also may be free for some time. Why not rent the driver too? Right? That's how they looked at the market. And it seems like, oh my, we have exhausted every way of looking at the mature industry. Then comes sidecar. What if, uh, if you are in the, in, in the Bay Area, right, there is always traffic. Um, uh, I'm not like Bangalore, but uh, there is still some traffic. But we say, you know, I want to get into a carpool lane. I might just pick up someone, forget about the money, I will just reach faster. So they tap into the community angle. So if you think about all the things that happened, the common factor is they started with a different worldview. It's a mature industry, but the worldviews are different. If this can happen in a mature industry like cars, any one of your startups, there can be a different worldview, right? And you can always look at the market in, from a different angle. And I will go through something. Suppose let's say you want to start being different. It, uh, if, has there anything changed and people tell me that because of the social media and all those things, it's so easy to be different. I'll prove to you that nothing has changed. In the yesterday what was happening was that the barrier to entry was very, very high. There were only a few outlets, few magazines, few newspapers. To get into that magazine was very, very high. But the moment you got in, the barrier to attention was extremely low because there are only so few magazines. The average cost was somewhere in the middle. But today, what has happened is it's the exact roles are reversed. The barrier to entry is extremely low. By the time I finish this talk, people would have Facebook message and tweeted it and then put it in LinkedIn and Google Plus and probably some of you might have put in a Tumblr blog post or another blog post. By the time everything, there is no barrier to entry, right? 
but the barrier to attention is extremely high for the exact same reasons that the barrier to entry is very, very low. Because anybody, if you can do it, anybody can do it. The average cost is still the same, right? So basically nothing has changed. You still need to build an awesome product. You still need to tell a great story. Now, how do you do it? How do you show that you are different? You start with a cliched statement, which is, you know, you really decide to be different. Why is it difficult to just fashionably say, I want to be different and actually wanting to be different is because it starts with uh, the stress and the straddle. The stress is if you are in a group, you want to stand out. The fact that nobody is around you, there is a stress because there is uncertainty. Right? So it comes with, will I succeed or will I not succeed? Is it there? Is it not there? And the straddle is, while you are outside, standing out, you have to belong to the crowd. Because that's where the people are there to buy, the market, buy whatever you are creating. You need to be one of the many, but you have to stand out. You see the problem? And then, to start with, there are no guarantees. Because if there were guarantees, somebody will say, how do you know? You have to quote somebody that who has already done it, then you are not truly different. Right now, it's a dilemma. If you say, I'm truly different, then there are no guarantees. Right? It's a dilemma. Plus, you have some help from friends. And they will say, you know, don't be foolish. Ah, it may not work. Why do you think, did God choose you? You are, are you the one that God chose that you should do this? If it was so simple, then why somebody else has not done it? Right? you will be foolish and all of them will say very basically there will be an oversupply of doubt. Like there will be many people who will say this is the reason why it will not work and many people will want to say it just to make, make sure that they are on your side. I don't want you to get hurt. Stop this. Right? So in the, in the name of your friend, in the friendship they will keep uh, dissuading you because even sometimes they may be genuine in their caring also because they want to see it's not worked for anyone. Why do you think it will work for my friend? Right? So, there is a lot of resistance for actually truly being different. And once you pass that resistance, you have to make sure that you have to create meaning. That meaning will not be as simple as we will be the lowest cost provider. Right? If you think about it, for those of you who have kids, when was the last time you said, Mike, I love my kids. Let me find the cheapest clothes available for them. You won't. If you are a buyer and you don't want to do it, why do you think as a seller you want to be the cheapest provider? It just does not make sense. And uh, have, uh, some of you might have heard of this uh, company called Banana Republic, which got sold to Gap for a gazillion dollars. And there is the, the way they started the company are two writers from San Francisco Chronicle called Patricia and Mel Ziegler. And the way they were trying to do this was that they had $1,500 in their pocket. And they wanted to do, they like, they both love fashion. And they wanted to say, you know, let me, let us build something, but they don't have cash, right? So they go to an army auction and they buy a few hundred Spanish army shirts. And then uh, they, they had invited a, a friend for dinner and uh, they had bought each shirt for $1.75. And uh, the friend uh, really liked the shirt and they said, how much is it? And they said, we want to sell you for $6.50 said, I'll buy one. And then uh, so the Patricia immediately ironed the shirt and everything, and then he tried on, but uh, there was one problem. The uh, arm was arm length was short. He said, I can't buy this. He said, no, no worries. We have a few hundred of them. I'll try another one. She ironed another shirt, and he again came in, and then even that one was short. They found that every single shirt had a short arm. So they said, oh, no, our startup dreams are done, right? But they said, what if we tell people that it's a short term, maybe that's a fashion. So they go to Marin County flea market and they put up a store. They pay $30 to put up a booth and say, Spanish Army short term shirts, $6.50 that one uh, uh, weekend. And they found that from morning till evening, they sold two shirts, right? And then they said, you know, this is like a two strikes gone. If it, if it happens the third time, then they have to close the business. Next week, again, they put the $30 booth. This time, this is Spanish Army short arm shirts, $12.50. They sold 102 shirts. Talk about the lowest price advantage, right? So never assume that just being lowest price, the only person who will get hurt is you. That's the only thing.
Next is not all the features. These are all the toolbars for Microsoft Word. I have tried this in many, many times. Until now, I have not heard anyone who says, I know all the, I know all the buttons. <laughs> right? And uh, you like to add features, but I don't think the customers like a lot of features. They just want to click a button. That's why remote controls are good. Just click a button and then watch, couch. Right? So, or you can go to, there is another place where you can learn what not to do. Anybody can guess? Which is in the Guinness Book of World Records. Right? You can, you can be the, the biggest of that or you can be the most pierced head or those kinds of, none of them will move the needle. But I'll tell you what can move the needle. Like I took an example of Amazon Prime, $79 per year. And then you may not be able to read those things, but about, uh, 25,000 movies and TV episodes for free. Free two-day shipping for any amount of uh, money you buy. And then about 180,000 books you can borrow on Kindle. Just $79. Now that's where you can make a meaningful difference. And why does Amazon do this? Very simple. Last year they had 5 million people paying $79. And this is not it. They found that in their research, every time somebody becomes an Amazon Prime member, they spend at least $500 more on Amazon every year. Now that, it's a win-win strategy. And it need not be as complicated as Amazon Prime. I took another example. So it's a uh, gift cards. Immediately you will see that free one-day shipping. It seems like Amazon will lose money, right? If somebody pays $25 and then you send them free shipping, Amazon will lose money. But they don't, because many times a small percentage of people who buy the gift cards, they never use them. So the entire $25 is Amazon's pocket, right? So now they say, let me pass it along by free shipping. Or even simple on Changi Airport while I was coming, if you see um, that next to the gates, they say, you will reach there in about nine minutes. Imagine the peace of mind for the person I'm running. Should I run? Should I walk? At least it's right there, nine minutes. All it required was some little thoughtfulness and it will make a big difference, right? Especially if you are running around with kids and everything, you know, the, we need to run, we need to run, but just in nine minutes you will reach there. It's there. This was the best example of this was before the smartphones and all came in. This Nokia was selling the world's largest selling uh, phone, right? 250 million in 2003 to 2007 or something. What did they do differently to get this kind of a reach? And it was not even, it's a, it looks like a dumb phone, but they went deep in, into, the, into the minds of the customers. They found that, you know, there are many people in the rural market, like uh, six or seven fishermen together will want to buy a phone. Ten farmers will together want to buy a phone. The entire family together want to buy a phone. So they've created features which are community features. That means the same phone will have multiple contact lists. So same for some, somebody can say, you know, I'm using this phone. It's like uh, one, I'm one of the many people who are using this phone, but I want to, don't want to spend more than uh, 200 rupees every month. They can set price limits per call. All these things in the same phone. And then they also found that uh, screen prompts in 70 different languages. Plus, because it's a rural area, there may not be electricity and everything, the phone can instantly get turned into a flashlight. It could turn it into an alarm, it could turn it into a clock radio. Price debt, 2,000 rupees. 250 million cell phones. What did they do differently? Instead of saying, we have a phone, you change your uh, work to suit our phone, they said, we will change our phone to suit your work. That's where you can make a difference. The key word is empathy. The big difference was that Nokia was able to see the world through the eyes of these people in the rural areas. And that's what we need to do in, when we build our product. We have to see how do we empathize and see the world in the eyes of our target audience. Next is to tell a good story, right? So even if you say, build the best, most awesome product, unless you tell a good story, nothing happens. The, the proof is, like, have you ever seen uh, uh, advertisements from Apple, iPad, and those kinds of things? Why would Apple want to advertise? Because if they're building an awesome product, they should not even be advertised. If they have to advertise, then why shouldn't we advertise, right? 
the best way to detect a good story in seeing when you start noticing how luxury items are sold like any luxury item high priced item they have, they need to tell a great story because otherwise why would somebody pay 10x or 100x the money that they need to pay so i took some stories for watches in fact i took a story for watch because if you really want to see time you don't even need a watch so all your phones have time but um, there is no need so but how can somebody convince to pay 25000 50000 100000 for a watch right they have to tell a good story some stories here they can get help from george clooney right so if you want to be like george clooney pay 25000 get an omega or you don't like george clooney you can be like zhang zi right get 25000 or you can be like leonardo dicaprio right it can be probably more than 25000 but just in case you don't like all the celebrities and all those things they have an overloaded story operator here they said you know you can't read it but it says a partnership to benefit environmental charities just a fall back story right just in case you don't like leonardo dicaprio lee caprio you might like environmental charities you just need to pay 30000 dollars for the watch right so there was another option you could have paid 100 dollars directly to the environmental charity but that won't benefit the watch company right so or they can ask you a philosophical question have you ever worn a real watch i mean all of you have to think about it if you are not buying them you are not wearing a real watch right or patek philip they make it a collectible so there is a story you can't read it i picked it up there it says you never actually own a patek philip you merely look after it for the next generation pay 100000 dollars and see you know this is for my grand kid i'm making an investment right so this one is a bookshelf in a bookstore you add a and there is no story there except to access right but you add a caption immediately it becomes a story stephen king collection right sometimes it requires as simple as that you have to use your creativity to make a difference accomplishments always tell a great story and it says this was the home page of 37 signal sets over 3 million people use our web based apps to get things done if you are a normal human being you may be like them and then you will you should use this it's a social proof their story there everything included in case of changi airport i picked another uh, snapped another uh, picture they they have an emotional advertisement immediately they follow up with another story it says changi world's most awarded airport it says a big story right there the bigger problem is in living up to the story because all this until now you can tell a great story but living up is a bigger is it's the biggest competitive advantage right there if you can live up to the story that you are telling i picked an example of zappos first of all selling shoes online is an amazing thing nobody before zappos there were a few shoe sellers but nobody believed the shoes could be sold online so even zappos they went through a uh huge um, up and down up and down and finally they got it right but how they got it right is with the free shipping both ways like if you don't know whether it is the right size or not you can order sh- shoes for three or four sizes keep the shoe that fits and then ship it back no cost to you seems like a great promise can you even imagine what it takes to live up to the promise logistics nightmare receiving shipping making sure that the customer service is happy there will be people who will order 10 pairs of shoes they will return only 8 and say i return 9 so all those things right so there is it's a lot of things so but if you, when they do it right they put a bigger barrier to somebody else who will come and say we will also sell shoes online because it takes a lot of effort to um, just fulfill that promise so if you if you want to see the layers of influence the being different is not what you say but it's what is perceived in the minds of the audience the mind the audience have to say i think they are different and that is influenced by what the story you tell so you have to tell the story that will trigger a perception that will say you know they are different and who will tell the story it's not machines it has to be people it's your people that will have to tell the story right and what will influence them is the structure like jim collins right people in the right seats in the bus so that's if the without the right structure the people will not be able to tell the story what will influence them it's the vision and values that's what people are aligned to 
and who will influence the vision and values? It's the leaders. That means you are the one who will influence the vision and values of the company. That will influence the structure and that will influence the hiring of the right people. That will influence telling the right story. That will trigger the right perception. Now the litmus test for whatever is, there is a very simple litmus test to see how different you are. It's in your elevate, elevator pitch. And all the time you have to think, the big question you have to ask yourself is, does the difference that I'm bringing in the product or service move the needle? And how will you know? Is like you, right here in the next two days, if you can start giving your elevator pitch to you, whoever you meet, and then watch the responses. For those of you who know neuro-linguistic programming, there is a tenet there. The meaning of your communication is in its response. You cannot say, he didn't get it. He must be a moron. I am right. So you can't say it. So if they don't get it, all it says is it's giving you feedback that you have to do something to change it so that they get it. Right? The meaning of your communication is in its response. When you give the elevator pitch, all your job is to observe. What is the response? If the, if the response is something like, sorry, what were you saying? Immediately you know that you get negative one point. Right? So it means nothing, there is no big difference and they were not even interested in listening to you. But if you say interesting, at least in the US, if they say interesting, they'll say, whatever, don't waste my time kind of thing. Right? It's not real, you should not literally take it as it is interesting. Right? <laughs> so it says, oh, whatever, please move on, I have other things to do kind of thing. So next, tell me more. This is where you at least pick their, pick their interest, a little bit at least. They want, they're interested, you know, little bit, tell me more, a little bit. Not a lot. You can't say, yeah, let me tell you, I was born and brought up in that and uh, no, they are not looking. They just want you to tell you a little bit more. That's it. But if they start saying uh, something like, now, how do you do that? That means you have picked their curiosity. Earlier you picked their interest, now you picked their curiosity. That means it's gelling well. Now, if they say something like, cool, is nobody else already doing that? That is when you have picked your interest. It means that it's so obvious that somebody else should have already done it. I'm very surprised that nobody else is already doing it. So this is the litmus test. Depending on where you stand, the effectiveness of your being different is there. If you are in the bottom rung, all it requires says is uh, that it's feedback, that you have to do keep moving. And it's very easy, right? There are so many of you here you will get a chance to at least test this, do this litmus test a hundred times. If you are humble enough and say, you know, I want to test this out and then give your elevator pitch and whatever they say, your, your response cannot be, no, you are not getting it. I'm telling you, you are not getting it. That person got it. Three people got it. You are the one who didn't get it. No, that won't be the right thing, right? So it's best is keep on collecting because ultimately it's an elevator pitch. It's not your business plan. And you'll get, learn a lot from listening to the response and not judging the person who responded, right? And last but not the least, I want to leave behind something which, uh, uh, which has helped me in my life and in my business. It's, I call it the evergreen insight. And it's a Buddhist quote. And you, uh, as you will see it, you will see that it's a very obvious thing says, when deciding among opportunities, choose the most difficult path. Why? Because 99% of other people will choose the most easiest path, and then you will already be different if you are choosing the most difficult path. With that, I hand it off to Mark. Thank you, Raj. Very good.